Right. The second thing I should do is to introduce myself properly because not everybody knows me. So my name is Klaus. Um, I've been, uh, what I'm doing, what am I doing for a living? I'm actually a C++ trainer. So this is indeed what I'm doing. I am going to companies, um, computing centers, etc., and talk about C++. So for good reason, this is why I'm now used to sit in front of a, uh, of a laptop and uh, basically talk to, to my screen. Um, this is what I've been doing the, the last weeks. This is to some extent fun, but um, this is why I also definitely appreciate um, seeing a couple of people. What am I doing apart from giving C++ trainings? Well, I um, also do C++ in my free time. So I'm the author of a C++ math library called Blaze. I'm also organizing a user group in Munich. It's also one of the user groups that is currently doing um, virtual meetups. So um, just check out um, what we have to offer. I think in two days, there's the next meetup given by Ben Dean from the S talking about um, the construction of C++ algorithms. All right, so since this is a Zoom meeting, everybody can ask questions at any time. So feel free to ask questions whenever you feel um, uh, I did not really go into detail enough or if, if there's just anything that, that raises your interest. Um, there is, if you know the solid principles, at least five natural points where you can interrupt me. So after each one of these principles, but I also don't mind if you interrupt me in between. No, um, this is definitely not a problem for me. Since I'm probably talking a lot, um, just interrupt me by saying question and then I know pretty well that you want to ask something and um, I'll stop um, when I finish my sentence. So yeah, tonight- Klaus, can, can, I have a, can I have a question? Of course. A general one? General uh, is, is the talk that you are giving now is the one that you submitted for uh, uh, CPPCon? Indeed. So this is what I submitted to CPPCon. I mean, I probably added a little more than I would do at CPPCon. Interestingly enough, there is now 75 minutes for a CPPCon talk. Um, so actually this might work out well, but um, I think due to questions, et cetera, it might be a little longer. I, I kind of anticipate it's a little longer, but the topic is the same. And well, I think it's interesting enough for a broader audience. So this is not just for a sub community or for a particular group of people. I believe actually this is something for every C++ developer. And also we had the uh, survey uh, before, uh, interesting for people from other languages. So people that use Java, C Sharp, Python, et cetera, the solid principles should be known to every developer. All right, so did I answer the question? Yes, thank you. All right. So tonight I'm going to talk about essentially software design. And just to make clear what I am uh, trying to talk about is, well, this is essentially not really software design yet. This is what I would call a component. Perhaps it's a class, perhaps it's an assembly of classes, but this is not really interesting for my purposes. It starts to get interesting as soon as there's at least one other component. And now this error is indicating what I really have in mind, a dependency. So these things use each other, the thing depend on each other. And of course we would like to um, manage these dependencies well. This is simple, but of course it can be arbitrarily complex. There can be many components. And of course you already anticipated a lot of possible interactions between these components. And this now looks like chaos. This is of course something that will prohibit you from doing reasonable software development. It will probably be be frozen, will not be able to continue to develop this for another 10 years. What you would like to have, of course, is a nice structure, something that people also call architecture. You would like to have guided uh, and, and yeah, ordered dependencies across so-called architectural boundaries. So indeed, as many people say, so for instance, Ken Beck, dependency is the key problem in software development at all scales. This is what we want to tackle. And this is essentially what the talk today is about, dealing with dependencies. And specifically, it would be nice if there would be a great, a helpful set of guidelines that helps us to tackle these dependencies. And this is now that the real topic, the solid principles. To some extent, I assume that you've heard about them. So very few people um, did not hear about the solid principles at least once, and you probably know at least one of these anyway. Um, 
but I think it is definitely worth to talk about them again, because very often there is some misconceptions what they actually mean. Sometimes people have only a very vague idea of what they really are. Um, and so talking one hour about the solid principles is, despite their age, um, definitely worth um, this time. So there's five of them. Um, the first of these solid principles is the single responsibility principle. The name already suggests a little bit, but unfortunately this name is also something that raises a lot of um, misconceptions. So we definitely have to talk about what a responsibility really is. The second one is called the open close principle. From the name alone, you cannot really guess what this is about, but still it's one of the most important, uh, so perhaps the second most important of these principles. The third one is called Liskov substitution principle, named after Barbara Liskov, um, who basically raised uh, this idea in 1988. Then there is the interface segregation principle. Again, the name gives you some idea what this is about, obviously about interfaces, obviously about segregating interfaces. And the fifth one, the last one is called the dependency inversion principle. This is the five. They have not dropped from the sky, so they are to some extent already old. So for instance, the second and third one both have been formulated or yeah, formulated in some form in 1988. But only one guy um, actually put them together. So Robert Martin, also known as Uncle Bob, in around 2000 decided that this is the five most important object-oriented design principles. This is what he called them. And then approximately three to four years later, Michael Feathers realized that if you arrange them in this order, then the first letters give this nice solid acronym. So this is um, what we still know today. These five principles in this order, this is solved. All right, so I already said that this is traditionally known as the basic object-oriented um, uh, design principles. So, as Wikipedia states, in object oriented pro com computer programming, SOLID is a mnemonic acronym for five design principles. What I want to show you today is that this is not just object oriented programming. Yes, this is where it comes from, and this is, of course, where it can be really nicely applied, but it is more. So, I will try to introduce SOLID as a guideline not just limited to all programming, but as a general set of guidelines that we can also apply to functional programming to generic programming, because the fundamental ideas of these principles very, very well also apply to any kind of any other kind of paradigm. All right. And with this, we are diving into adventure of the solid principles. And of course, I do them in order. And the first one is the so-called single responsibility principle. What I wanted to do is I wanted to start with a nice, crisp definition of what single responsibility actually is. And so I went to the obvious place to find such a definition, Wikipedia. So this is what Wikipedia has to say about the single responsibility principle. The single responsibility principle states that every module or class should have, a have, should have responsibility over a single part of the functionality provided by the software. And that responsibility should be entirely encapsulated by the class, module or function all its services should be narrowly aligned with that responsibility. That is actually a pretty nice statement. It makes you feel you know, kind of cozy. Yes, this is what I want my software to be. However, it also, from my point of view, raises a question. What is a responsibility? So I think this is not making it clear what a class really should have only one off. So, one responsibility, all right, but what is it? Commonly, this principle is therefore abbreviated as everything should just do one thing. This is definitely an oversimplification of what SRP really tries to do. Uh, and this is a really hard question. Does my thing do just one thing? Yeah, does a standard vector do one thing? Does a string do one thing? This is very hard to, uh, to answer in general. And so I tried to find a better explanation. And I continued looking for people that know about this. And the next quote is from the book, The Pragmatic Programmer, which I feel is a much better um, uh, summary of what SRP is supposed to be. We want to design components that are self-contained, independent, 
and with a single well-defined purpose. This is where they use cohesion. When components are isolated from one another, you know that you can change one without having to worry about the rest. And you can imagine that it is the second sentence why I like this quote so much. This is exactly what I'd like to have. If I can change things by just changing something in one place, and I, if I do not have to worry about breaking anything else, then I'm actually in a very nice place. Then after a day of work, I can go home, rest uh, assured that nothing is broken. Still, they do not really explain pretty well what this single purpose should be. Yeah, a single well-defined purpose, but luckily they give another word. And I believe this is leading towards what SRP really has in mind. So cohesion. And Tom DeMarco had a nice statement about cohesion that I think um, closes all the gaps that we so far have. Cohesion is a measure of the strength of association of the elements inside a module. A highly cohesive module is a collection of statements and data items that should be treated as a whole because they're so closely related. Any attempt to divide them up would only result in increased coupling and decreased readability. So SRP is not really about it does one thing. It's more like it represents one thing. Essentially, SRP states that everything that does not really belong together should be separated. And only those things that cannot be really separated because they're too tightly coupled, because they simply belong together, these should be kept together. So ultimately, SRP tells us that we should not put everything into one class, and that should we have many small items that hopefully in harmony work together. Now, of course, um, that was Uncle Bob also, Robert Martin. He simply said a class should have one reason to only one reason to change. That's a very simple but a very wise uh, sentence or statement because this is exactly what this is uh, what this represents. So let me show you an example. Examples are are um, definitely helping in understanding. And I have a simple example, a circle class. Okay, okay. I know what you're thinking now. The guy comes with a circle example. Um, this is what everybody's doing. I know this is for some reason is a simple example. I will build on that. Lately, I'm using a lot of circles, I know. Um, but this is so simple that we can focus on the design aspect. So this is indeed a simple circle. It has a radius, uh, is, yeah, a constructor that takes a radius. This is the data member, and there may be a couple more data members. So there may be um, some rotations, some uh, center point, whatever. There is, of course, also a couple of getters, get the radius, get center, get rotation. There is a couple of functions that allow me to translate, rotate, perhaps um, resize the circle in various ways. And then in this example, I also ha have a function that draws to a screen, that draws to a printer and a serialized function that puts the circle into byte stream. And so I can transfer the circle to some other uh, system, to some other process, um, to an MPI process, for instance, whatever. There may be more, but this is definitely uh, enough to, to talk about. This class is not adhering to the single responsibility principle. And why? Well, you may think, and you're probably right, that this is primarily because of th these three functions, the to draw and the serialize function. So why are there a problem? Isn't it nice that I can draw a circle in various ways and that I can serialize it? Isn't this what a circle is about or a member function is about? Creating properties for some kind of thing, so like the circle here? Well. Let's think about when does the circle change now? For what reasons does the circle change? So first of all, it will change if the basic properties of a circle change. Well, um, with basic properties, I mean, if we represent it differently. So instead of a radius, we use the diameter or um, something else entirely. I think there is good reason to change these things, that, but I would consider them pretty stable. Yeah, And the geometric entity, the, what a circle represents has been pretty stable for the last couple of million years. So probably this is not changing very often. 
However, it probably changes also when screen changes. Suddenly I have to use, um, I have to rewrite my draw function simply because screen is different. And of course it also might change if printer changes. The interface of printer is now updated a little bit. I have to update my drawing. And the byte streaming, of course, poses the same problem. Slightly different, slight change, perhaps a different interface. Um, I need to update the circle. I also would need to change the circle if the way I draw in the first place changes. So for instance, if I want to, um, instead of using OpenGL, I want to use um, Metal Vulcan simply because it's newer. It also might change because the serialized function changes because I have to switch from li little to big endian. And I hope you get the point. This circle is changing for various different reasons. Reasons that not have nothing to do with circles in the first place, but with drawing, serialization, and all kinds of uh, auxiliary uh, topics. And this is, of course, something I would like to avoid. I would like to change a circle only, and really only when the circle as such changes, the geometric entity, as I said before. It's probably pretty unlikely. This is perhaps already pretty convincing, but there is perhaps another argument why this, these three member functions are a problem. And that's again, the dependencies. So let's take a look at the dependency graph for the example that we have so far. In the center is a circle and it now has a friend too, it has a square. And these two are for instance required in some overlap calculation. Now, so this overlap component is um, either just giving a true false statement to so do two uh, shapes overlap, perhaps it's computing the area of this overlap, something. Now, shape, uh, overlap only needs to know about these geometric entities, but because of the dependencies that come along with circle and square, it also now knows about screens and printers and byte streams, things that it actually doesn't really need. And unfortunately, there's a transitive dependency now. Perhaps I indeed have some effect on changes from screen on overlap. Perhaps not, perhaps I do, but this is of course a dependency that I would like to avoid. Essentially the advice that the single responsibility principle gives me is cutting down these transitive dependencies. So if I consider circle and square as kind of independent things and screen and printer and byte stream, all the other things as separate entities, if I basically put them next to each other, then I can much more easily and more nicely express the real dependencies. Overlap needs to know about circles and squares. Mm -hmm. Drawing, on the other hand, the aspect that I um, really do with circles and, and screens is now explicitly stating that it needs these two. And it's totally independent of, um, of anything that it, so overlap is now independent of anything that it doesn't need. And drawing really expresses the dependencies as it should be. So the drawing aspect is a separate entity and a single responsibility principle gives us an idea about that. Now, SRP is um, not just about classes. In this particular case, I was talking about classes, but let's talk about one function at least to show, yeah, one example uh, that I can show you that is, is definitely more than just a class guideline. And I picked standard copy which I believe is a wonderful example for many things, but also for the single responsibility principle. So standard copy is a function that really does one thing. Now again, this common knowledge interpretation. And when does it change? Well, standard copy changes, not really. It builds on fundamental conventions of the language. So for instance, it uses the um, copy assignment operator, which basically means, um, it would only have to change if really copy assignment would express, it would be expressed differently. That's very unlikely too. So from that aspect, it's very stable. But everything else has been extracted from this function. For instance, memory allocation. Standard copy does not allocate and it is not concerned about allocation at all. You as a caller are responsible to provide an output range that is big enough. You have to provide something um, that copy can copy to. No, something big enough, or perhaps you have a couple of um, um, inserters uh, of any kind that help to do it. Copy is not concerned with memory allocation. And that of course, again, helps to, um, to deal with one aspect at a time to not depend on things that are not required. 
and probably the authors, so Alex Stepanov would um, have found a good way to make this work, um, but as such, I think it is really, really beautiful. So, as a takeaway at this point, the single responsibility principle is about preferring cohesive software entities. Everything that does not strictly belong together should be separated. And as is already a pretty strong statement, this basically already says that indeed the idea that many people have, unfortunately, to put everything together is wrong from a general point of view, not just object-oriented point of view. All right, are there any questions at this point? All right, then let's go on to the second one, the open closed principle. That one is hard to interpret from the name alone. So I have to tell you what um, Bertrand Meyer in 19, 1988 formulated. Software artifacts, classes, modules, functions, etc., should be open for extension, but closed for modification. So this means that any software that I have should always be extensible. Of course, I want to extend software. Um, I want to build on it. Um, that's one of the reasons why it's called software in the first place. Now I can change things. I can add things. However, when I add something new, I should not have to modify existing code. In a perfect case, I really just want to add code, never want to um, touch anything that already exists. Now, let's take a look at an example for um, the open close principle. And this is a slightly longer example, but I think uh, I found a good way to talk you through that. We start with an enumeration. Now we have several kinds of shapes, again, circles and squares. And for them, I have reserved enumeration that really names them all. Well, I have two at this point. Additionally, now I would like to have an abstraction in place. Some abstraction allows me to, for instance, store several kinds of shapes in a vector of shapes. So I have a base class. The base class is a little special, something that you might not have expected. The base class in the constructor takes one of these enumerators and stores it in its private part. And well, then as the, the getter, I can get um, the shape type. So I basically remember what I am. The circle class now inherits from shape. So circle is a shape and the circle probably initializes the shape with a circle enumerator. So now I remember I am a circle, pretty okay. Then there's of course all the other stuff that you've seen before. There's a radius, other data members, the opposing getters. What I've done now, however, is I've moved stuff outside. So translate, rotate, and my toy uh, draw are now outside of circle, which is reasonable. This is essentially what the single responsibility principle just before told us. Um, so this should work well. Circle has a friend. Circle has the square too. Um, there's just one big difference. Um, that is that, of course, the square initializes its base class with the square enumerator. Else, of course, things would go terribly wrong. So this is the primary change. Else, uh, a circle is pretty similar to uh, a circle. It also can be translated, rotated, and drawn. Again, consistently here in this example, I choose free functions um, in order to satisfy the single responsibility principle. Now I want, as I said before, draw shapes in it in an abstract fashion. So let's say that I have a draw function that has a vector of unique pointers. So I have a lot of shapes. I want to draw each one of them. How do you do that? Well, of course, first by traversing um, all the shapes. So range-based for loop, go over all the shapes. Single shape is now called S. And now I have to ask, what kind of shape is it? This is why I store the, um, the type so I can ask this type and based on the type, I can cast to the right kind of shape. And I'm actually absolutely sure that it's the right thing. Um, so I get the type or, I, or um, I get the pointer, I cast it accordingly. If it's a circle, I cast a circle. If it's a square, I cast a square. 
And this works pretty nicely. And then just a, a quick glimpse on the main function. Um, I have a vector of unique pointers here that I fill with circles, squares, probably many more, because three is not enough in the, in the usual case. And if I call draw, I indeed see the according output of, um, of every function. All right, great. Now let's return to the OCP, the open close principle. This example is broken with respect to the open close principle if I want to add a new kind of shape. Let's imagine, as a toy example again, that I would like to add a rectangle. Well, what do we have to do when we add a rectangle? First thing, we have to extend the enumeration. This is already something that would consider a problem because this is a central point of truth. Everything apparently in this example depends on the shape type, a very strong dependency. You change the shape type, you might uh, change a lot of other things as well. So it's not two values anymore, now it's three. Perhaps this changes the underlying type. Um, and of course, because I know this uh, enumerator in or this enumeration in a lot of places, I might have to change things in, in, in many other places. So the circle at least has to recompile. The square, because it knows the enumeration too, has to recompile. And of course, I have to touch draw, a draw function. I have to add another case statement. So in case it's a rectangle, I have to do the right static cast. I cast a rectangle and I draw accordingly. Now, the problem here is not that I have to re recompile draw. This is something I have to do anyway, probably. But the problem is that I have to touch so many places. How many four um, floops do I have that contain a switch statement? Or even more simpler, how many switch statements do I have that now need to be updated? In a bigger framework, this can be dozens, perhaps even hundreds of switch statements that I now have to touch. So adding a new kind of shape may be a nightmare scenario for, for, any, for every maintainer. This is definitely a clear breaking of the open close principle. So what can we do better in this case? Um, and I believe you have thought about the probably right solution for the last, say, 10 minutes, or oh, five minutes. It didn't take me that long. You were thinking like, why an enum in the first place? There is some a feature that helps us here, virtual functions. Well, I should make a point that um, the virtual function is definitely a good um, solution here. The enum solution is still used because of the performance. There's something I don't go into detail here. I've done another talk on that topic, but um, the virtual keyword is, um, is kind of a solution now. So, in the base class, I now introduce a virtual translate, a virtual rotate, and a virtual draw. You note that there is no enumeration anymore. So it's totally gone. So I do not have to initialize my base class. I, do not, uh, have, I don't have any kind of data member because I don't need to store anything. It's now a classic interface. So circle, again, inherits from shape. Doesn't have to initialize it though. Um, however, it now needs to overwrite the uh, three pure virtual member functions. And a square does the same thing. So it does not have to initialize its base class anymore. There's nothing to initialize here, but it needs to overwrite, translate, rotate, and draw. And this definitely helps with regard to the open close principle. The draw function suddenly becomes really, really beautiful, really simple. So what do I do to draw a shape? Well, I call draw. And I do not care about the actual type. I do not care about any types of shapes at all in this function. I just call the right virtual function. And so indeed, for the, from the point of view of the open close principle, this is a perfect solution. I do not have to touch many, many places anymore in order to do my drawing. I can now add a rectangle without having to, uh, uh, having to modify the draw function at all and many other functions uh, also. So nothing changes down here. I basically now enable me to very easily add new types. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Except for one tiny flaw that you might have noticed, and it might have raised a big 
question mark in the back of your mind. Didn't I just say that we should, should not have the draw function as a member function? Now it's back in the class as a virtual function. So isn't this a violation of the single responsibility principle? Oh, yes, it is. It is exactly the same violation that we have dealt with before. But now we're back here with the argument that the open close principle is satisfied by making this a member function. And perhaps to some extent, this is now a little bit confusing for you. It should be confusing because after all, these other principles were introduced as basic object oriented design principles. This is, I would argue, classic object oriented programming and it does not satisfy all of these solid principles? No, actually it does not. This should be surprising and it should also raise a big uh, exclamation mark in the back of your mind. You should now think, oh my, it is not that simple. Object during the program is really difficult to get right. I have to think about a lot of things. I have to consider a lot of details. So, one of the things I'm trying to do lately in, in several talks I have given and will give hopefully is to point out that indeed there is better solutions today. Question, yes. Go ahead. Okay. So one of the points I'm trying to do uh, to make is that there is new solutions. There is simpler solutions. We have actually already a solution that allows us to follow both the open close principle and the single responsibility principle. And I know this is now a little more complex. It looks like it is more complex, but still I want to draw your attention to a solution that we call type erasure. So in this solution, we approach the problem completely differently. The first thing we do again is we write a circle, but note the circle does not have a base class at all. It's just a circle. And it's the simplest kind of circle that you can imagine. It stores a radius, it has a center point, whatnot, a couple of getters, nothing complex. Again, I am using the free functions. And why not? It's the right thing. I do not couple aspects like drawing to a simple thing like circle. So this may of course be provided in a different file, totally different aspect uh, for simplicity. It's not just listed uh, directly behind. The square is the same thing again. So it's again, similar to, to circle. Um, it does not inherit from the base class or for any base class, and it just provides the free functions as it should be. Now, the additional functionality that I can add easily. Now type erasure is based on one idea that I now represent in a class called shape. There is a shape again, but this time indeed it's not a base class. It's more like a container that can take anything that behaves like a shape. And now I go over this a little more quickly because this is not the main aspect, but I want to point out why this is a very nice solution with respect to our SRP and OCP. So I start with telling you that in the private part of shape, I actually define a class template that is traditionally called model. And this model is storing any kind of T, any kind of T that can be translated, rotated and drawn. As long as the type T can provide these three functions, it is a shape from my point of view. I express this explicitly by inheriting from a base class, which I call concept. This concept based class is also in the private part of shape. It comes with a lot of virtual functions and it essentially represents a traditional interface class. It just renamed the functions to not cause confusion. It also simplifies things a little bit. So there's a do translate, a do rotate and a do draw. This is the things that shapes need to be able to do. Everything that can be translated, rotated and drawn is a shape. Now, I store one of the things by means of a concept pointer, cleverly, smartly, like uh, in form of a unique pointer inside the, the shape. The next thing is that I provide the same interface for shape that I would expect on any other kind of type. So translate, rotate, draw. 
I would like my things to be translatable, rotatable, drawable, and so I should be I should be able to do the same thing with the shape. These functions merely forward the request to translate to the actual thing that I store inside. So this is the pointer, it calls the virtual function, and via the virtual function, I go back to the actual type that I store inside. Based on this mechanism, that was now the five minute version of type erasure, I'm now actually able to store anything inside a shape. Anything, any T. Give me some T, as long as I can translate, rotate, and draw it, I'll take it. It will not compile if I cannot do these three things, which is a very nice property. But as soon as it does, everything's fine. And I store it in the abstract fashion. I uh, store it by means of the concept pointer. I say new model here. So the, I need the special member functions. I need a couple of other things too. Um, but essentially, this is uh, now what I have. There is a draw function, again, for a vector of shapes. But this time, I do not have pointers anymore, but values. Now, a shape contains something. It can be a circle, it can be a square. And so I do not really need the pointer anymore. This becomes simpler. And I simply ask the shape to be drawn. So this is the draw function that now triggers a virtual function call and calls the according function um, in, in a shape. But remember, I do not really implement how things are drawn inside the shape. I merely forward a request to another free function. So, and just to really express how beautiful the solution can be, look at the main function, there's no pointers anymore. There's no inheritance anymore. There's no virtual functions visible anymore, uh, no memory allocation visible anymore. All of the things are nicely hidden. And so from a usage point of view, this is really tremendously beautiful. So I totally know that this is a very, very quick um, introduction to type erasure. It's not a good introduction, most, most more like a, okay, look, we have better solutions today. I have covered a couple of more details in another talk that I've given in the London C++ user group recently called Embrace No Paradigm Programming. Um, in this talk, I